Well, amen. <laughs> For all of you brothers and sisters who are at home, I want to warmly welcome all of you as well. It's so good. Um, just gives me the kind of vibe like when I was a teenager, 15 years old, uh, in Singapore Conference Hall, listening to Douglas Jacoby for the very first time. Life's crucial question. It's like a deja vu when everybody's walking into the hall and it's going to be a great night tonight. Uh, but before we are here to hear the treat, okay, of um, DJ speaking to us tonight, it's good to come into, uh, into the presence of God and let's worship Him in singing. And before that, can I invite all of us to join me in a word of prayer before we start singing this evening. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, we are so grateful to come into your presence this evening, Father Lord, because you have allowed us to. Thank you that we have a loving God. Thank you that in you, Father, we find compassion, that we find the love that we need, that as we are out there, Father Lord, in the world, being battered and scarred and, 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 and challenged, Father Lord, every single day, we know that we can come back and be in your presence, Lord, and be loved. Thank you, Lord, for reaching out to us. And as we come into your presence this evening, Father, we pray that, Lord, you will look over us, watch over us, Father, Lord, as, and, and let us put down all our distractions. Let us put down our burdens and our anxieties, Lord, so that we can worship you. So that, Father, you can, we, we will be able to have that spirit of praise, the spirit of reverence, and the spirit of humility to come into you your presence, and, and we want to sing, Father, with the joy in our hearts. We love you. We pray for a great night today. All this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let us stand and uh, join us in singing. We're going to start off the first song in singing, I Need Your Love. Okay, God is so good. It's His love that we need all the time. Oh, I need your love. In the shadow place, I can get enough of your sunlight on my face. When it's cold and dark, or I'm far from home, you are in my heart, and I never walk alone, and just like a tree. Planted by a stream, thirsty for a drink of your love. I can't face a day without some time to pray. I sing this song to say, I need your love. I'm a tiny child. I'm a tiny child. But when I'm with you, I will not grow tired, cause there's nothing you can do. Your love makes me strong, though I'm small and weak, and the whole day long, you speak through me when I speak, and just like a tree. Planted by a stream, thirsty for a drink of your love. I can't face a day without some time to pray. I sing this song to say, I need your love. You gave all for me. You gave all for me. Though I cursed your name on that bitter tree, oh Lord, you suffered for my shame. How can I thank you? Your love paid my way. All that I can do is live for you every day. Just like a tree. And just like a tree. Planted by a stream, thirsty for a dream of your love. I can face a day without some time to pray. I sing this song to say, I need your Just love. Just like a stream. And just like a stream. Planted by a stream, 
thirsty for a drink of your love. I can face a day without some time to pray. I sing this song to say, I need your love. Amen. You guys sound great. Um, we're going to have one more song before our brother Stephen comes up and leads us in a word of prayer. And uh, we are going to sing How Great Thou Art. Okay? Let's just really, in this song, uh, worship God, lift it up to Him, because our God is indeed uh, how great is, is, is just our God. Amen? Um, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee.
Amen. Please be seated. Amen. What a privilege tonight. We're going to hear from DJ Amen. Uh, just a few days ago, just a few days ago, Agnes uh, just told me DJ was the one who baptized Agnes some 36 years ago when you were a campus minister. Right? So, brother, thankful for that. Because of you, I have Agnes. So, let's all bow our heads and pray. Father God, we just want to be so thankful that we have, uh, God, you are our rock, our fortress, our strength, our protection, Father. We're just so grateful that we can worship a God that is so merciful, gracious, slow to anger, quick to forgive, and quick to bless. Father, I pray that we can come before you tonight with an undistracted heart so we can, so we can worship and hear your word. Father, I pray that you guide DJ uh, to, to speak your word clearly and powerfully. And I pray, God, you, you open our minds, our hearts, and also our ears to hear, to hear, to understand, and to obey your word, Father. We thank you so much for tonight. We, we also thank you, Father, because of you and many brothers and sisters who make tonight possible, God. We thank you. We pray all this in your son's most precious name. Amen. It's with great pleasure that I'm able to welcome and introduce our speaker for tonight, Douglas Jacoby. Let's put our hands together. I'm grateful for DJ because he's impacted my life in many ways through his books and his writings. The book True and Reasonable was one of the things that helped convince me to put aside my atheism and decide to put my faith in God and be baptized. His book, Shining Like Stars, helped me to be more confident in desiring to share God's word with many other people. I regularly pour through his website to look for answers for my questions about faith, my questions about doctrine, only to find that his answers point me to more and more research and deeper learning. And for that, I'm actually very grateful. I'm grateful for DJ because his courage and wisdom in defending the faith and teaching sound doctrine is a great upward call for me and he is a great role model in his own personal evangelism. Recently, I've had two calls with DJ and I really appreciate how he empathized with what all of us are going through here in Singapore. Thank you, DJ, for your kind words. Thank you for making a trip here to Singapore, for teaching us at night, for helping us to be excited about scripture and passionate in applying it to our lives. So for those who'd like to contribute more, please visit his website, www.douglasjacoby.com, where you can also um, find so much more resources and make a private donation to support his ministry. So right now, let's have one more song, and then we'll have Douglas to come up and preach God's word. Let's all rise for one more song. Amen. So before DJ comes up and speak, we're going to speak. We're going to sing one more song, a stream in the desert. Amen. I'm thirsty and hungry and longing, but nothing on earth can fulfill. There's a place in my heart and it's empty that only my God can fill. A stream in the desert when I'm thirsty, the richest of hell when I'm weak. Through the darkest of nights, I think only of you, oh your presence I earnestly see. My troubles and foes can surround me. Then I call on your name and I stand. I remember your power and glory. And in praise I will lift up my hands. For seeing you in the sanctuary, to your presence my longing so clings. I will praise you as long as I have life to live, and I'll sing in the shadow of your wings. If 
I had every passion. If I had every passion and pleasure, and if ease and success marked my ways, well, your love still would be so much better than life. So my lips will keep singing your praise. A stream in the desert when I'm thirsty, the richest of fair when I'm weak. Through the darkest of nights, I think only of you, oh, your presence I a stream in the desert, a stream in the desert when I'm thirsty, the richest of fair when I'm weak. Through the darkest of nights, I think only of you, oh, your presence I earnestly see. Oh, your presence, oh, your presence I earnestly see. One more time. Oh, your presence I earnestly see. Amen. Please be seated and welcome DJ. Thank you. Good evening and thank you so much for making time to be here this Wednesday evening. Also to those sitting at home or standing or maybe in a painful position, which is why you can't be here. But I'm thrilled to be in Singapore again. I always remember my first visit. I was spending a month in KL, Sha'alam, and drove to Singapore. And at that time, it was a different Singapore, 1983. Of course, driving across the bridge from Johor Bahru, I was entering a different world all the same. And it's been amazing to see that transformation, but also to see so many of you who become Christians in these decades. Uh, it's just uh, very encouraging to me. I want to bring you warm greetings from Scotland. You can see the title up there, and I'll justify that in just a moment. Um, it's a title that I have preached one other time, or at least part of this, and that was in Norway. Norway is one of the countries I work with. But this is um, a more recent uh, family configuration. So you can see uh, Douglas and Doug, uh, the dog, and you see my wife, Vicky. Vicky is British. She's been here many times. She knows some of you, not just from London, but even from visits here, and she sends her love. Uh, she would love to be with me, but traveling is hard since she had that stroke back in 2008. Uh, but she does come and sends her love to you. Our kids are all much older in their 30s. Uh, the dog is those, just seven, so we still have some time to be with her. And she loves it. And that's that old man. And I admit, yeah, that's me. So greetings from Livingston, Scotland. We moved to Scotland in part because we lived so much of our married life not in UK. But my wife's British. We had lived only five or six years in Britain. Four years married. Then we went to Sweden for a while. We lived in Australia twice and a lot in the U.S. And so it's only fair. And also, we have one parent still living, her mother. I thought, let's be near in case something happens. Her mother lives in northern England. We live in Scotland, so it's only a few hours' drive away. So that's good. At any rate, we're there. We're thinking probably for five years or so. That's not a prediction how long my mother-in-law will live. We just thought, <laughs> let's get out of the, the States with its materialism. <laughs> And even kind of good to get, get out of the big church situation into a smaller situation. I thought that would be good for our faith. Scotland, of course, has history. It's got all kinds of building structures. It depends how worldly, I mean, it depends how much TV or films you watch. You may recognize some of these, but it's lovely. And one, it's the windiest country in Europe. And one thing we love, I was talking to my wife last night, so that's the typical temperature. So for us, it's wonderful. Average summer temperature, 15 degrees, 1.5. But that's, not, that's averaging day and night. So for us, that is ideal. And for the dog, too. Which means that we do get some snow. Uh, and not a lot, but uh, that's really cool. How many of you have never experienced snow? Mm, quite a few hands, OK. <laughs> That's our, you know, we have two uh, European-born children, and then we adopted one child from China. She just finished her master's degree a few days ago. And uh, I'll fly back to Scotland, 
uh, in a few days, and she'll be coming for a few weeks. It'll be good to see Lily, not uh, Chunli. So Scotland, beautiful country, Harry Potter train, famous castles, Edinburgh. We, I wanted to live in Edinburgh. We wanted to move there, buy a house, have a garden and a garage, and the house would only be about as big as that monitor there. So we, we moved just, just outside, not very far, but it's wonderful. Uh, I work a lot in London. Probably the airport I go through the most is London. Uh, Kathmandu is where I was last week. Uh, one of our teachers in India, Rago Katarga, joined, and we had a great time in Kathmandu. One of the interesting highlights, I stayed with uh, some friends, and they arranged for us to spend some time with a Hindu priest and a Buddhist monk. And if you get my newsletter, you saw today me sharing about that interaction, which was very encouraging, uh, great dialogue. I've been in Cebu for five days, flew in last night. Thank you for picking me up, uh, Land. Appreciate that a lot. Uh, and uh, this was for APLA. Uh, we had about 180 students teaching worldviews. So it's part of apologetics, but it's, it's how people think, the different views, religions, philosophies, how to understand and connect. I'll be going to some other places uh, this month, including even Atlanta, where we lived for 15 years. I'll be in Orlando, which is in Florida. I'll be in Cambridge, which is uh, in Boston area. I've been teaching for the Ukrainians on the very sensitive subject of warfare and Christianity, uh, but that was Zoom. Even though that's the country I visited the most in Europe, I, I didn't actually go there. Um, Brazil as well, uh, Kingston. We had a graduation a few days ago. Here I am in the city of the Merlion, <laughs> which you guys take for granted probably, but great place. And another city I go to frequently, I, I mean, Somewhat frequently. I mean, I was there in April. I was there last year. I'll be there next summer. Um, maybe you'll join me. Can you see the Temple of Artemis? Well, there's not much left of it now, just a single column. But Ephesus is an amazing place. Ephesus is one of the places we know a lot about because we read of the Apostle Paul as an evangelist planting a church, starting from scratch in Acts 19. He writes to Ephesus and to Timothy in 1 Timothy, probably also 2 Timothy. And then in addition, there's the letter in Revelation. And there's another letter about 10 years later from a guy named Ignatius, which shows us that they turned around. So it's actually a very happy story. That's the great theater. Holds 24,000 people where the, the riot, well, it was a riot. They, they shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours Megale, Artemis, Tonefesion, two hours, and Paul uh, thought of speaking to the crowd, but he would have been killed probably. Well, I hope one day you'll visit Ephesus if you've not. This is the title of the message, and that may be, you say, what? How do you get that from Revelation 2? Well, part of it has to do with the way I was influenced by a friend and a book that he wrote, which I read earlier this year, but we'll get there in a moment. But that's the title of the message. Let me just give a tiny bit of background. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom that are in Jesus, was on Patmos on the account of the word of God. I was in the spirit uh, of Revelation 1.10 on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a, sound, a loud voice like a trumpet saying, what you see in a book, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay. This is Jesus Christ speaking. It's not like a, I sense the Lord speaking to me kind of thing. <laughs> it's a loud voice like a trumpet, not a muted trumpet. Just imagine a trumpet in your ear. This is a loud voice. It's serious. It's so serious that my friend says, he, he looks at these, these letters more as sermons than as letters. And he may be right. Uh, they're all uh, very challenging and they look like sermons, but they also look like letters. We simply don't have the time to look at all of them. But this evening, before the question time, we're going to look at two. Chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him 
who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And then, of course, I know your works. What have you been reading lately in the Bible? I mean, I read Revelation uh, last month. I also read Zechariah last month, which is extremely influential. I'm working on the Psalms, and well, I finished Matthew yesterday, but a lot of Psalms, and the three songs we sang felt like Psalms, <laughs> felt very much like Psalms. But what part of the Bible are you in? Are you doing some, some old and some new at the same time, which is a way to keep us focused on Christ more easily? Um, anyone reading Revelation right now? You're afraid to put your hand up. Anyone reading Revelation? One person, okay, in, okay, in row eight. Difficult questions I'll be sending your way. Um, <laughs> no, actually, it's wonderful stuff. Revelation is also a very short read. I mean, you can read it in a sitting very easily. Most of the chapters only take about 30, 40 seconds to read. Well, let's get practical here. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and you're wondering, well, what does that mean? Every letter stroke sermon begins with an identification of the speaker and their different ways of describing who Jesus is. Who Jesus is using symbol symbolism from the Old Testament, familiar terms from the New Testament, but it's Jesus who holds the seven stars in his right hand. What are the seven stars? I don't know. But what I do know is that Roman coinage of the time typically showed the emperor, and you can see the Augustus on the right side. The left side, I see Hadrianus, so that's the emperor 117 to 138. So that's, he became emperor around 10 years after Revelation. But you can see the seven stars. He's not the only one. But the idea is that imperial power, and power that's, it's not just local, Rome, they're claiming power over the world, I don't think they used the term the known world. Uh, that belonged to the emperor. That is, he is the highest authority to whom you give your ultimate allegiance. And in Roman documents, and many have survived, and on Roman coins, and thousands if not millions have survived, we frequently see the emperor referred to as savior, son of God, or divine, or some other phrase like that, which is taken to refer to Jesus Christ here. So already, at this time when Roman persecution is about to start, there's not that much in the first century, not Roman persecution, but in the second century, it's about to ramp up. And he's assuring, Jesus is assuring people where the true authority lies. Does that make sense? That's the significance of the seven stars. So the Lord is not this guy or that guy. It's the Lord God. And then he says, he walks among the seven golden lampstands. Another way of speaking of Jesus. And you can, you can trace the symbolism here. But Revelation is only 400 verses, 404 verses. But it points to or quotes, alludes to the Old Testament several hundred times. Now, there's a lot of nonsense about this great book of the Bible. If you want to be able to, to understand it, well, it always helps to read it. But the three keys, I would say, are you need to know a little bit of Roman history. Not much, but you need to know something about the Roman Empire. You need to know something about the kind of literature this is. It's apocalyptic with all these symbols and animals and monsters and so forth. But the main thing you need to know is your Old Testament. And to someone who's not thoroughly read the Old Testament, Revelation will not mean a lot until you talk to your friend or listen to some guy on the radio, and then now you'll know the meaning of it, except you'll be wrong. But if you know your Old Testament, you won't get sucked into that. Shall we continue? I know your works. Now, this is something that Jesus says at the beginning of most of these letters. Sometimes that's translated deeds. When we hear works, if we're from Protestant background, then we sometimes think, oh, salvation by works, earning my salvation. That, okay. Jesus is saying, I know your life. I'm looking at your life because I am in a position to see exactly what you do all day long, 
to know what you dream at night, to know what you're thinking, even when you're sitting at church. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil. I wonder who those are. But I've tested them who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I'll clarify that in just a moment. He says, then, I know you are enduring patiently. So if you read this quickly and out of context, you say, okay, works is like work and endure patiently, don't get tired, keep going, work, 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 follow your program, your agenda. You could, you could read this almost, be almost like the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, where they've turned from idolatry, but it, there's a focus on labor, and I'm not quite sure that's what he means. Usually in the New Testament, when it talks about works, it's referring to how we interact with other people. And the phrase good works or good deeds is pretty much a technical term. It can mean other things, but normally good works means helping the poor. That's the normal context. The poor within the church especially, because they reached out to poor people, uh, but the poor in society as well. And they've endured patiently. But I know your works is the endurance endurance in loving others, or is it something else? Is it just simple, simply physical endurance? The older we are, the more we need that. Or maybe doctrinal endurance, and that's what I'm going to suggest. What the Ephesians were doing well was holding to the teaching, and they weren't tolerant in the modern sense of tolerant. When I was born, tolerant meant you got along with people from different backgrounds and different opinions, and it's fine. And we may have different views. I don't judge you a bad person because you have a different view than me. We work together in peace, in harmony. Today, there's a false idea of tolerance, which means you pretend all thoughts are equal, all theories are valid, all viewpoints are good, and don't ever tell anyone he's wrong. <laughs> well, that's not tolerance. I talked about this at length, that whole class on that in Cebu. <laughs> but think of the um, Ephesians in this way, that they're, they're very strong on doctrine and even detecting it, something's wrong in the church. For example, he says, you've tested people who pretend to be apostles. They're false. And then later, he mentions the Nicolaitans. Now, no one, I don't think anyone really knows who the Nicolaitans are. It's from the word Nicholas. And there's another Nicholas in the Bible in Acts 6, so some people say Nicholas went in a bad direction and then created a sect and people followed him. Well, it could be. It could be that Nicholas Santa Claus, Father Christmas, who lived in the third century, maybe, you know, went to his head, all these uh, Christmas greetings and everything, and then he, we don't know what the Nicolaitans are, but what they were doing was somehow off. It was at odds with the gospel and the Ephesians wouldn't, wouldn't stand that. Now, I'm going to suggest something you may never have thought before. Okay, here it is. I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. NIV says you've lost your first love, right? Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. I could be wrong, but up until this year, I always thought that was talking about your love for God and the works would be the things we typically measure. How many minutes you prayed, how many times you finished the whole Bible in a year, how many people you share with. Not that I'm counting anymore. Most Christians don't count that anymore, even in our churches. But when I hear works and love, first love, and do the works at first, I think, okay, what was I like when I was 18 years old? Let's see, obnoxious, uh, quarter inch taller. <laughs> um, but I, I think it works that way. But what if it's not so? What if this is about relationship? What if love is not love for God? And I'll give you one reason I, I think it may not be, is that when people lose their love for God, they normally don't care about doctrine. People who, in my experience, they don't care about God, they don't read the scripture, they say, oh, let people believe whatever they want, it's just interpretations anyway. They're not ones that say, oh, no, 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 we need to stick to the word. We need to 
compare. And if they're not teaching it, we need to instruct them or, or we need to deal with this. This is significant. When people don't care about God, if they've lost their love in God, why would they care? People can believe what they want to believe. Who am I to judge them, right? It'd be the modern attitude. But when love is used in John's documents... It always refers to love, I should say, when, it's, when it, it's used in John's documents, it nearly always refers to love of people for people. I mean, you can find, for God so loved the world. God's love for the world is there. But the way love is used in the gospel, 39 times, love for each other, love for others. You've got in 1 John, which is the second greatest number of occurrences, which is amazing because that's a very small book. I remember it's only 105 verses, very short compared to the gospel. And even in the, the minuscule second and third John, there's that emphasis on love and even in Revelation. And so some 80 times the apostle of love, which he's sometimes called, is used by God to encourage us to love more. What if you've lost your first love, is talking about the, how much you loved at the beginning of your faith. It's not talking about your love for God. It's talking about your love, as in being a loving person. A friend of mine who's a very interesting writer, Jim McGuigan, in his commentary on Revelation, says that the Ephesians risked becoming, and it's a very American analogy, although he's an Irishman, Risk becoming straight as a gun barrel theologically, you know, very straight, and spiritually just as empty, because if you look down a gun barrel, which I wouldn't advise, especially these days, but it's still a good analogy. If not, Jesus says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, when we think of the lampstand, we think of the menorah, the Jewish uh, symbol, which uh, is a very common symbol now. In 1 Kings, there were 10 of these. After the Babylonians destroyed the temple, I think we only find one. One referred to in the Old Testament Apocrypha. So it was just one lampstand. But it was important to the Jewish people. And when the war with Rome finished in 70 AD, the general Titus took the slaves. Most of you know the story, right? I mean, the two key dates in the first century are 30 and 70. So this is 30 for foundation of the church, 70, destruction of Jerusalem. And 1.1 million Jews are killed or enslaved. They bring the slaves to Rome. The slaves build the Colosseum, which is finished in the year 80. So that was not around for most of the first century. And as a victory monument, this is very close to the Colosseum, there's this arch. By the Roman Forum, there, there are three, but this is the Arch of Titus. And if you look at the detail on it, you can see them bringing the menorah, which was taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. Their lampstand was taken away. What does it mean to have your lampstand taken away? I think it means you'd no longer be a church. You would no longer be bearing witness to God. You would no longer have that light. But don't tell me, at what point does that happen? Is it if you drop below nine and one-half members and average attendance is less than twice a month? I mean, I, I don't know. You know, that's something God deals with. But I would hate for the lampstand to be removed, just as I would hate for the light to go from your eyes or for us to stop being salt and light. We're the light of the world. The city set on a hill. And finally, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you say, let him hear. Well, doesn't everyone have an ear? Well, most everyone. Right? <laughs> Some people lost an ear, but I'm not really thinking of those people right now. This is a phrase Jesus used. That is, if you are able to hear. Do any of you assist your hearing with hearing aids? I won't embarrass anyone by asking you to stand up. Not that I'm embarrassed. I've got them. I got them uh, just probably only 10 years after I should have got them. I got them in my late 50s. So, see, my wife, she sent me to the doctor 
when I was 40 something, you should have your ears tested. You should have your hearing checked. A lot of men will hear those words. <laughs> and there, of course, there's hearing and there's hearing. And my wife would also say, you're not hearing. You know, I would say, Vicky, I'm looking for this object. Where is it? She'd say, it's over. Oh, okay, I got it. She said, no, 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 I, I got it. And off I go. One time that happened and I was going to chase and get the thing up. And I was running upstairs and, and when our daughter Lily, Chun Li, was just, she could talk, but not, she just learned how to talk. Daddy doesn't listen to women's talking. <laughs> Oh, so that wasn't just selective listening. There was a gender bias. The, whoa, okay. Anyway, so I went to the audiologist. He, I don't drive an Audi. He wasn't testing my Audi. He was testing my hearing. Okay. And I went home, and I, I said, Vicky, look, perfect. Perfect hearing. So that isn't it, then. <laughs> it's not that your hearing isn't perfect. <laughs> it's the other thing. You're not listening. Well, in the next decade, I started getting tinnitus. It's ringing all the time, both ears. And everything started to go. And I went back, and the guy said, yeah, you actually do fine listening to lower voices. But the higher the pitch, the less you hear. So in a way, it was true. And especially the fellowship, very hard to hear women talking. <laughs> so I can justify myself some. And if you're a man, and, anyone, and you're saying, yeah, I don't hear as well, don't wait for it to keep deteriorating, go and get some hearing aids, cheapskate. Okay. <laughs> to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Conquers, a great word in the New Testament. Nikau, I conquer. Nike, victory. Nike is the victory, the goddess of victory, and athletic shoes, because you know her as Nike. Paul's, uh, Paul, John is saying, we want you to conquer. Jesus is saying, if you listen, if you change, if you conquer, this is going to be a great thing. So my friend says, are you a Nike Christian or not? I mean, are you actually conquering? Paul uses the word more than conquerors in Romans 8. Huper nikao, huper nikuntis. Like in English, it would be super conquerors or which sounds like heroes with powers, or maybe it would be hyper-conquerors, because that's closer to the Greek, but that suggests a certain inattentiveness. To the one who conquers, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. As a young Christian, I thought, wait, wasn't the tree of life destroyed in Noah's flood? It's the kind of question I was probably reading Revelation incorrectly, and I was reading Genesis incorrectly. But the tree of life was connected with immortality. And immortality is not a given for us humans, but it's a gift of God through Jesus Christ. We can live forever in the paradise of God. The paradise, the garden, the, it's a return to the beginning in a kind of way. This makes me think several things, and I've asked myself some tough questions. Seven, in fact, but I'm only going to do three right now because I'm making some progress repenting. Number one, am I stronger at loving others or labeling them? I think the Ephesians were probably pretty good at sniffing out heresy, calling, calling error, error. But what am I better at? Second, do I insist that others have to agree with all of my biblical views before I will respect them? I mean, I hear this quite frequently. I was commending one brother to another brother, and he said, well, that guy, did you know he sinned in this way? I was simply saying, he wrote a great book, which could be very helpful. His, his response was, well, he's not that great. You know, he committed a sin. <laughs> oh, well, okay, I guess I'm no good either, you know, because God uses sinners. We, we tend to distance ourselves from others over all kinds of reasons, some petty, some significant. But why would you expect anyone to agree with you on everything biblical? Is that realistic? I mean, you yourself keep changing your mind on some things. No church has arrived. And third, do I imagine that on the day of judgment, God will reward doctrinal correctness over loving and faithful Christian living? I've asked this 
to you guys before in Singapore. Just a few years ago, maybe you remember, maybe you were listening. I said, at the day of judgment, would you rather have lived a very haphazard, somewhat hypocritical, well, committed to Jesus sometimes, but not other times like, but I belong to the correct church and we believe all the correct things, or at the day of judgment, would you rather say, Lord, I tried to live for you, I loved for you, I suffered, I studied your word, I shared my faith, I was on fire. I know I, I, I just didn't understand that doctrine here, and when they tried to explain it to me, it didn't make sense. Where would you rather be? Sincere life, incomplete doctrine? Or perfect doctrine, but a life that doesn't match? Which would you choose at the judgment day? Some people are afraid to answer that. But Douglas, uh, both wings of the airplane are equally important. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that that analogy doesn't really work with this. Firstly, because in 1 Timothy 4, Paul's not saying that Christians have to understand technical theology. He's saying that Timothy, as a teacher, needs to live the life backing up his teaching, his teaching which is based on reading of the Scripture. Look at the context. It's not about what we think it is. But it's much easier, I think. Let me just find a group who agrees with me, and if not, I'll start one that agrees with me, and then I'll just stay there and feel superior. Or to be willing to make certain compromises, to be patient with others, but to live for God, to be on fire. Well, where would you rather be at the judgment day? Think about that. The book my friend recommended, he's a New Testament scholar, uh, Jeff Wyma, Canadian fellow, but he's still a really good guy. Sermons to the Seven Churches of Revelation. And I'd like to, before I give the final challenges, before our first break, I'd like to share with something from his conclusion. It's a bit long, so thank you for your patience. While its commitment to orthodoxy, that is straight doctrine, correct belief, right? While it is a virtue for which the Ephesian church is praised by God, it was also apparently a vice of this congregation. What's true of people can also be true of churches. Their greatest strength can paradoxically become their greatest weakness. The Ephesian church was so preoccupied with identifying wicked people, exposing false apostles, and rejecting the sinful practices of the Nicolaitans that a spirit of suspicion and mistrust permeated their fellowship, making it impossible for them to be the caring, compassionate community they had been in the past. In short, they were a church of loveless orthodoxy. Think about that. Let's hold on to the faith. I hope you didn't hear me saying doctrine doesn't matter. Any opinion is fine. I didn't say that. I love the Bible too much to say that. I thought that I would stop reading the Bible. Don't get tired, but persevere. Focus on life. First Timothy 4, as I mentioned, is speaking of public teaching, not you understanding the ins and outs of the Trinity or being able to do a deep class on predestination and free will. People are actually more important than ideas. I'm not trying to dumb it down. I'm not saying that truth is unimportant, but people is where we focus, and when we, when we lose sight of this point, we lose our love, and it's all about love. And now I speak to myself, to the churches in Great Britain, and to the churches globally. Let's return to the level of a lovely, loving, involved fellowship that we enjoyed in the past. Remember our first love, sharing our lives, speaking the truth in love, comfortable or not, being patient, extending mercy, and imitating Christ. Ephesus, read the letter again. See what you think, what's your conclusion are they indeed sound on doctrine and stingy in love? We're going to have a stretch break, and stretch break, just 90 seconds. It's not long enough to do what I know you're wondering. So 90 seconds. You sheep meow. Not basic. Sa'at. 
in 90 seconds, I'm continuing, and we're going to Sardis. 85 seconds. Stretch. Stand. You, you need to stretch. Hey, Suhi. All right, don't go far. Only 55 seconds left. Okay, let's return to our seats as we begin part two of the evening's presentation. Part three is the question time. Part one was Ephesus, and now part two, we're going to Sardis, which is not the letter after Ephesus. That's Smyrna. Let's talk a moment about these seven churches. And I'll share another idea that my friend Jeff Wyma suggested, and I thought about it. I think it makes sense. Probably, probably all the churches... All seven probably read the letters to every church. I think that's quite likely. I think they knew what was being said to their neighbors, that is to say. So we have Ephesus. And Ephesus, I've mentioned, is wonderful. It's the most visited site outside of Istanbul. It's the most visited site in Turkey. Turkey has over 300 ancient Christian sites. Turkey is where the Apostle Paul spent 60% of his ministry. If you randomly go to the letters or acts and you look at Paul, there's a good chance you'll end up somewhere in Turkey, which used to be called Asia Minor or Anatolia. Peter also had a big ministry in Turkey. We know that from 1 Peter 1.1. And so did John. Ephesus, Smyrna, which also has a lot to see. Modern Izmir, third city of uh, Turkey. A great place where my... Uh, the agents I normally use when I visit the biblical world, that's where they're based. And then there's Pergamum, which is very striking on a mountainside. I really like that. And you might too. Thyatira, which is the middle. And I'm, I'm putting it this way because it's a chiasm. Thyatira is the middle. It's the worst of the churches. Jesus has something good to say about all of them. Well, not really Thyatira. He actually has nothing bad to say about two of them. Two of them that are doing very well, uh, number two and number six. Thyatira, not much is left of that. Sardis has much more left, where we'll be in the next, for the next 10 minutes or so. And then there's Philadelphia, not much left. There are many Philadelphias in the ancient world. There are many Antiochs and many Alexandrias, but this is the one. And then there's, of course, Laodicea which is well excavated, well worth visiting. Now, were there any other letters? Did the Lord only send seven, or were there any other churches in that area? Well, can you see from your seat where the cities are? Can you see the yellow in the back? Can you see the yellow? If that's clear enough. And it's normally suggested that the letters were delivered on a route. You know, there's probably... Another, that's if you did an order. There are probably other ways you could have done that, but yeah, maybe that was a postal route. Postal routes were well established in the Roman Empire, but if you look at the red, I, I just put four there, but there, there were many other cities um, which certainly had churches at the time. So they would have gone through many cities. So maybe the selection of seven is uh, more symbolic or more for effect. So maybe there are more letters. And as I would suggest, they're all more powerful when you read all of them. Because you see, Ephesus commended some, but they're in danger of losing the lampstand. Smyrna, much more encouraging. Then you go to number three, Pergamum. Oh, there's some hard challenges there. Thyatira, it's so bad, these guys, I mean, are they even Christians, you wonder? It's just very bad. And then uh, you go to, to Sardis. They're in trouble, but there's still hope. 
Then you go to Philadelphia, about which the Lord has only good things to say. And by the way, their numbers aren't that impressive. They're small somehow. And then you come to Laodicea, the wealthy, westernized, you could say, self-absorbed city, so wealthy, in fact, that twice they were destroyed by earthquake, and they say, no thanks, we don't need help from Rome. We'll rebuild ourselves. They were extremely wealthy, and if you visit that, you'll see. So those are the seven churches. Looking at it this way, see the minuses and the pluses? So you have minuses in most of the places. Uh, Sardis is number five. I'm going to look at that, and I've titled this section, Writing on Reputation, question mark. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Just different ways of referring to Jesus. And Sardis is a pretty large site. Uh, there's some good things. In fact, I've been there a number of times. I've only been to lower Sardis. Sardis is actually plural, Sardes in Greek. It's the Sardises. There's one at the top of a cliff, and there's one at the bottom. You'll understand why that's important in a moment. Jesus says, I know your works. Again, he knows our lives. He knows what we're doing. And don't let anyone tell you that it doesn't matter how you live as long as you have some faith. That's utterly false, and it's a, that's just a contradiction. That would be like saying it doesn't matter how you treat your spouse as long as you love them. It doesn't matter even if you beat them or call them names. As long as you like them or say you do, you'll be fine. I mean, that's total nonsense, and we know it. Then he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now, why would he say that? Um, This is a picture of a skeleton I took in Scotland. Now, what would be your assessment? Are any of you trained as zoologists? Um, Anyone working in biology or science or paleontology? You know, maybe your judgment is not valid, but in this very informal courtroom, would you say that it's alive or dead? I mean, would it be too that. Would it be being too harsh to say that that, that's dead? Thank you, by the way, row two. Thank you. Live or dead, what do you say? You're judging me. (laughs) Well, um, you don't really have the flesh, the the motion, the reaction to stimuli, and the other things that normally, you know, I think you're dead. Wake up! Wake up. Strengthen what's, what's about to remain, what remains is about to die. I have not found your works complete. Remember what you received. Keep it. Repent. If you will not wake up, I'll come like a thief. When the Lord comes in the Bible, and the Lord comes many times in both Testaments, usually it's good news for the oppressed, very bad news for the oppressor. Usually it's some kind of a judgment. And here he'll come, and you won't know at what hour. And this is an allusion to the history of Sardis. Sardis is there. That's Turkey, the country on the right. Can you see Crete at the bottom? And you can see, the, you can see Greece there, Corinth, where uh, you can see a lot. There's the Black Sea at the top right. And just above that, the horrible things happening today in the Ukraine. But in Sardis... I mentioned there's an upper and a lower. To take the place, you would have to take the the fortress at the top. The walls are unscalable. The fortress is impregnable. No one can get in. But one time, a soldier was a bit careless. I think he dropped his helmet, and it fell down, and he went out and inadvertently to the enemy revealed a a path, a secret path, an invisible path. And And they got up there, and it was destroyed. King Croesus of Lydia, the ones who started making the first coins of the world. Uh, Croesus was wealthy. Rich as Croesus is a phrase you may hear sometimes. This king thought, no one can get us. Well, not only was it taken, this happened twice in Sardis's history, where she was unprepared, and someone snuck up there, caught him off guard, and that was it. So all New Testament scholars take this as a reference to that historical point. Verse 4, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, names here representing people, people who have not soiled their garments. That sounds really bad, doesn't it, like they lost control. I think he's referring to, uh, 
He's, he's, it's a, I just realized that translation's a bit funny. Uh, <laughs> good. Like, if you're incontinent, sorry. God won't look at you. <laughs> okay. Our babies are ruled out, straight out. Yeah. Okay. But in the Bible, uh, clean clothes and, and dirty clothes are fairly common images for lifestyle. So, dirty clothes or filthy rags, as in Isaiah 64, means your life is not pleasing God, you're not even trying, it's very sinful. That's what filthy clothes means, filthy rags. Clean clothes or dressed in white, you see that in Revelation, but in the Old Testament and the Psalms, and that represents someone who's living for God, perfect or not. White versus filthy rags. I hate it when I hear people say, oh, our our righteousness is like filthy rags in your sight. Our best efforts are detestable to you. That's wrong. I think your best efforts are probably pretty pleasing to God. It's when you don't try that things are off. But righteous acts is a better translation of that. Your religion is unacceptable if you're living a life of sin. Well, he says they'll walk with me in white. They're worthy, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. Can you see that? And again, the one who conquers, and what's the goddess? Nike, Nicole, I conquer. Conquering, that's a common theme here in these letters. Never will his name be blotted out of the book of life. I get a lot of questions about uh, predestination. Does God know the future? If he's all-knowing, does he know if I'll be saved or not? Of course he does. Then I have no choice. No, you're making that future the future that he knows. But then I have to make the future that he knows. No, if you change, then he'll know a different future. You're confused. You're putting God in your frame. You're, we're in the book of life as Christians, but it's actually possible to be removed from the book of life. So for people who follow certain doctrines, that may not be good news, but if, you're, if you weren't planning to cheat on God, you shouldn't bother you too much. Then, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels, and again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's the little letter to Sardis. I want us to focus on just this part, that is, uh, verse, part of verse 1 and verse 2. Let's let it sink in. I'm going to read it again. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Can we just focus there? I'm sure there's multiple sermons you could get from this little letter. But just right there, it's that idea of reputation, of looking alive but not being alive. Let's talk about church, and let's talk about our lives. We may have a reputation as a loving church, as a church that practices family. Certainly in our younger days, when we didn't know what we were doing, uh, boy, I mean, you couldn't get enough of the fellowship. It was almost a competition. Who can stay longest before we have to leave the meeting room? People love it. A family. A family where we're honest with each other. A family, not an army, <laughs> but a family. Today, can you say, I want you to meet my brothers and sisters, and you're going to feel family like never before? Some Christians can say that. Others wouldn't dare say that to their friends. It kind of depends what part of the world you're in. And believe me, because I visit these places. We have a reputation. So is it exaggerated? I guess that's the question. Is the reputation earned? You may have a reputation as something that you're not. A lot of times people think I know answers to questions I don't know the answer to. <laughs> they think I'm wiser than I am. I'm not. I promise you. We have a reputation that this is a church that knows the word. In my early days as a Christian, this is my fifth decade, so you can figure it out. 
Our churches had a reputation of being people who knew the Bible so well that some leaders would tell their members, stay away from them. They know the Bible too well. Like, they'll, they'll convince you. Like, they'll mesmerize you and, you know, watch out. Well, 20, 25 years later, in some places, the reputation is, oh, those guys, that church, they're the ones who don't know the Bible at all. No one has any training. They, I mean, they really, and sadly, in the last 10 to 20 years, I'm starting to agree because I know from personal interaction that most brothers and sisters really spend very little time in the Word, certainly not on a daily basis. Now, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to be cruel to you. or I, I know I'm generalizing, but, and you may be above average, but on the planet, most churches, if I guess that the average person studies the Bible twice a week, that's about right. Most days, they just don't have time. Because how can you keep up with social media and binge watching if you're studying the Bible for 10 or 20 minutes a day? That's unreasonable, isn't it? At least that's the thinking. The excuses are stunning. Do we know the word? Or is that an exaggeration? Do we care about the lost? Passion for a mission? <laughs> well, many places, yes. Now, I'm really privileged. I, I, I visit uh, normally 20 to 40 cities a year. And I, I visit places where people are on fire to spread the word, they love God. Other places where almost nothing's happening, where not a, one, Christ, one person's become a Christian in the last two years. And I see both, both ends. And it's possible you could care and be passionate and you wouldn't have the, the immediate reward. I, I don't want to be too mechanical, analytical here. But do we have, we used to be known for our passion and many of my friends in other groups say, you guys, as you've matured, don't lose the passion. Yeah, you've done a lot of things that are not right, but you've done some things that are really right, and we could learn from you. We wish our church was like that. You know, just being honest and about our strengths and weaknesses. Are we vibrant? Is it a reputation that we're alive? This is a place where you feel God's spirit. Everyone's filled with awe where there's growth in every sense of that word, or is that just an exaggeration? Oh, we're a church of prayer. We love to pray. No one could stop us from praying. We lean on the Lord. Or is that more something we did before we had kids or before we had the new version smartphone? And I could ask these questions not just about one assembly, which is what church means anyway, but what about our family of churches? What is the reputation? Well, it depends where you are. But in Sardis, they were reputed, were reputed to be alive but were dead. What kind of face were they wearing? Did they even know how far they had slipped? People notice. One of the people I'm reaching out to right now is a very interesting fellow. He is a a guide in Turkey. Turkey, as you know, is a secular republic, all believing in one of the great monotheistic faiths. And this fellow, here we are standing at Colossae, he said, Douglas, I've noticed, you know, because I lead tours to Turkey, Israel, Italy, Greece, 10 or 12 countries, usually a couple times a year. Some of you will come with me. He says, I, I noticed the groups who come are very different, but the Christian groups really shine out. They're not, trying, they're not sarcastic, they're friendly, they're helpful to each other, they, they genuinely care. He's not just talking about my people that I bring, he's talk, it's a bit broader than that. But he says so much so that I think I believe in Jesus. I said, really? Has, um, do you have a friend helping you through the scriptures? No. Uh, have you been baptized? No. I said, you know, we live a long way apart, but... Any way I could help. He said, that'd be great. How about this afternoon, we get back to the hotel, we sit down for a couple hours. And we did. Now, don't, don't judge me here. We did this over beer and peanuts. I don't know if you ever need, any of you are strict teetotalers. He wasn't the strictest practitioner of his own religion. <laughs> but for two hours, we talked about the central teaching of Christianity. 
which is that God has become one of us. He's loved us so much, he's come to our world to rescue us. That's, a, that's quite an idea. We looked at John 1, 14, John 1, 18, and he said, okay, I'm going to read the Gospel of John. The next week he had read it completely. The week after that he read it completely. He's done it three times now. And even though I won't see him for a few months, we're in contact through the media. And I, I'm praying that our friend, he'll just keep growing. But, but, okay, what was the point? The point was that he didn't ha- need to hear some reputation about followers of Christ. He just sees it. And he says, that's different from that. You don't have to be above average intelligence to compare things like that any more than that room's a bit colder than that room's a bit warmer. I mean, it just is. And he noticed, and that encouraged me greatly. Anyway, I've got lots of stories like that. Let's look at you and me as individuals. Do we practice what we preach? What we say others should do, do we do? If we teach lessons or lead groups, small groups, medium-sized groups, practice what we preach. <laughs> you know, leading a group sometimes or doing a presentation kind of keeps you honest because you go, oh boy, I feel sick. I'm not living the life, I don't think. It's just, it's good. But practice what we preach. Do we know the scripture? I, I can't make any rule on this. I told you maybe 10 years ago, I stopped counting. I, I finished the whole Bible for the 50th time. And for the 51st time, I thought, instead of the 51st time, I'm just going to read the Psalms every week all the way through. So I read through the Psalms you know, 50 plus times. And I still read the Bible, um, often in English, though my main projects are, are more in the other languages. And, and lately, I even got an analog Bible. <laughs> Look, you can actually see it. It's not in cyberspace. It's... And it's hefty, and it's got space to write comments. My, my wife got one, too, and, and that's good. Five or ten chapters a day, this is good stuff. I stayed in Nepal with my friend Mark Templer. I said, how's your study going? I, actually, first I was asking him, how's your, language of the Nepal, how's your knowledge of Nepali going? Because the guy speaks, it's crazy. How many Asian languages he speaks? I don't just mean Hindi and Urdu and Kannada and Tamil and Farsi, but, I mean, he's doing... Nepali now. He says, yeah, I, I just do the, you know, the Nepal, I'm just doing that once a year, but the other two times a year, I'm reading it in English. He says, I just read the whole Bible every four months, and well, I mean, he became a Christian in the early 80s. Surely he's, why do you have to keep reading it? It's not like it's going to change. Hey, I became a Christian in the 70s. This is still my main book. This is what, if we're going to Please the Lord. This is, we build our lives on the word of Christ. Matthew 7. This is what we build our churches on. But worldwide, we have so much disagreement and tension and disunity. And sometimes it's opinions about different verses in the Bible. But often I notice that those who are very loud in their opinions don't really seem to know the Bible very well. They get their knowledge third hand from the internet. Do we know the Bible? And when we do, it's um, challenging and it's humbling. Are we evangelistic? I admit, <laughs> through the years, <laughs> there's some times when I think, whew, I'm glad I didn't have a visitor today. <laughs> At church, I mean. Because the way that thing was, that announcement, boy, that, whew, glad I didn't have anyone today. And equally, there are times I thought, oh, stupid. This would have been the perfect day to bring my neighbor. It was so good. <laughs> but not knowing what it will be is quite difficult. Agreed? And, and some people, they just say, I, I give up guessing. But we share what we've been given. And surely that's got to be part of following Christ. Are we caring? Are we loving? Do we pray fast and give to the needy? Now, technically, I'm not supposed to know too much about your prayer, fasting, and giving to the needy. Because Matthew... Six, Jesus says, then you would be stripped of your reward in heaven. So you're not supposed to, you know, focus on that. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus assumes when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast. It needs to be part of our lives. And as I've been preaching Sundays, most places, I only preach from the Sermon on the Mount this year. 
And that's what our small group's been focusing on too. I know your works. You, singular, Christian, or you, plural, it's plural here, but you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Those are Jesus' words to Sardis in the late first century. We believe and we have experienced that those are Jesus' words to us in the early 21st century. Writing on reputation, that's the message. Before the question time, I can't resist at least inviting you to Turkey. Next summer, I've got a tour not to Turkey coming up in October, but uh, a global Smyrna meeting where we'll be visiting all seven church sites. There'll be a number of uh, well-known biblical scholars. Right in the middle, you can see my friend Jeff, the Canadian. Some guy to his right, you can see me. I know most of these people because I... I attend conferences, and when I read a book I really like, I get in touch with the author unless he's dead, because that's against the Bible. You're not allowed to contact the dead. But a week of teaching and visiting the sites, and after that, join me for a few more days, and we'll visit Colossae and Hierapolis and Miletus and some other good places. Well, I'm, I don't know what the precise instructions are for the Q&A, so um, David, are you the one who's going to explain this? But we're at part three now. How many questions? I'm not the one with the limit here. I'm flexible. He's asking me how many questions to take. Um, that depends how long the, you know, what verse said, you have a reputation? Oh, that's an easy question. But what were you saying about predestination? That's 59 minutes. <laughs> you guys decide. Half hour? Or if you have a question, Is that what you said? would you like to put up your hands and I can come to you and you can ask that question. Um, anything that is related to what you have learned tonight or what you have heard from um, Douglas, right? Anyone? And you can also write it on a piece of paper. Not everyone wants to be filmed. Um, <laughs> so you, you write it on a piece of paper, pass it up, and we'll read it out. And we can normally cover three times as many questions if it's written. That's up to you. Some places I go, they, you know, they use the technology, they text the questions to the tech guy, it's projected up there. Uh, hi, Hello. my name is hey. Ronald. Thanks for your very <coughs> enlightening lesson. I actually want to know more about your, your views and uh, advice for, for a typical person who lives in a city on evangelism. Because what I find very okay, challenging is that... Okay, can I ask you, that, um, if you could take your mask off, because otherwise oh. I really don't understand what you're saying. Oh, really? Sorry. It's nice and slow. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let me turn my hearing aid on. Okay. What I want to uh, get your advice on is how can we evangelize? I think in the past, I think there is a system in a sense that, okay, everyone come together, let's go out and evangelize. Uh, mm. I think uh, in later years, uh, we have done less of that, but we focus more on personal. But I also realized that in the recent years, I find it harder to do it because first thing, I'm more sensitive to how people will, I may say the wrong thing or things that are not uh, so socially acceptable or even politically correct, that's mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that when I come to the workplace, I find that uh, nowadays I can basically go to work, finish my day pretty much on my own without talking to anyone. Uh, of course, the advice is to let's open up my heart and really talk, but what are, what are some of your views, uh, mm -hmm. one of your, some of your advice, how we can put it into our practice? And you go to a workplace. You don't just uh, un take your pajamas off, put on your jeans, and work from home. You have an office or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us one right way. It was interesting. There was a time in the 90s when one of our, he's a great man, um, said we need to bring back street preaching. This is in the 90s. Because in Africa, 
he found whenever he did that in rural Africa, huge crowds would gather. Now, he also told us it was because he was the Mzungu, he was the white man, and people would come to try to see this oddity. But there are places where you can, you, you hardly need to be sensitive at all, just start a conversation. There's settings even in the West or in Singapore where, you know, a conversation can grow, particularly if you approach it, if you bring up spiritual things indirectly. For example, a conversation about zombie movies, which I'll be talking about to the staff tomorrow. Um, but in general, in places like this, that more on the street corner preaching, it, it tends to alienate people more than attract them. There's some people who don't mind, but they're in a very, very small minority. Um, the answer is, of course, always to be personal, but there are times when both can work. So I'm, I'm afraid I don't really have an answer for you. I think you guys in Singapore are more likely to be able to figure that out than me. But if we live as Christians in the workplace, and when we're visiting the in-laws, and when we're out, people notice and opportunities just happen. I mean, for me, it happens in my neighborhood, and especially walking the dog, who's a far better Christian than you or I. Um, as far as in the workplace, that's very different from, <laughs> it's not like it's your only chance, because you go into office, and it'll be a thousand days before you're there again. No, they're going to see you, you know, 250 days this year or something like that. So there, if you wear out, you're welcome quickly. That's not good. It's like the man who blesses his neighbor loudly in the morning. In Proverbs, the one who sets his foot too often in his neighbor's house. He'll come to hate you. So in the workplace, we need to be even more sensitive. And people have hard lives. Life is hard. There's so many opportunities. You discern someone's having a hard time. If you're there, a listening ear, a, a shoulder to cry on, it's amazing what people would, will tell you. But just live as Christians. What can I say? Um, boy, I just I can't tell you what to do there. And, and even I, I mean, I've helped people become Christians when I've been incredibly insensitive. So it's not all down to technique and sensitivity. Some people are so forgiving that they feel bad that they feel bad the way you were speaking to them. But they're so receptive. In our world, the, white, the fields are still white. All right, that was the opening question. Appreciate that. There was another question, how to get to Ephesus. You can get there by boat. Um, Istanbul, you can fly to Izmir. It's just over an hour away. If you go to the village of Selçuk, then it's walking distance. And that's a wonderful place. Third question. Does anyone have the microphone? Okay. That second question was sent by telepathy, and I'll take more of those if necessary. Well. Any paper, any questions written down yet? Uh, hi, Doug, my name is Philip. So I'm hey, Philip. one of those uh, guys who get to, don't really know much about the Bible, but got them third hand from YouTube. So I have a question about um, baptism. Uh, in particular, I think recently I've been hearing about this topic called baptismal regeneration. Yes. Which was, uh, I think there's quite a few videos that talk about how baptismal regeneration is a false doctrine. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the videos that I watched was actually even said that he actually admitted that the first century churches actually practiced this uh, and uh, actually practices and preaches baptismal regeneration. But now, they, since they believe that this is a false doctrine. Okay. So I just want to know what is your comment about Yeah, of course. Thank you, Philip. Uh, baptismal regeneration is a bit of a technical term. You know, Titus 3.5, I think most New Testament scholars would say is definitely a baptism passage. And it talks about regeneration. John 3.5, also another baptism passage. Titus 3.5, John 3.5. But what, when people, it's very ironic that anyone would say, it's a false doctrine that your life starts again in baptism because this is in all the ancient creeds. It's what really every church believed until a few hundred years ago. Uh, what they mean is that your life begins anew, you're born again, whether you have faith or not. The power is in the water. It's like magic. Now, if that's what they mean by baptismal generation, the power is in the water, we don't believe that. But if they mean... Are we born of water and the Spirit? Yes, indeed. 
So I avoid that term because some people will misunderstand. Interestingly, I had two COVID debates. Uh, normally I have a debate a year with prominent religious figures or agnostics or atheists. But this is the first time I'd had debates with someone who believes in the Bible. And the first day was actually on, are you born again in baptism? We were expecting 900 people at the university, but we had to cancel the event because of COVID. But he didn't want to cancel, neither did I. So I still flew to his city, and we had the videographer. And I think there was one other person, I don't know what he was doing there, and then it was me and this guy, uh, Thomas Ross. And because there was no time limit and he had a ton of material, the debate was four hours long. You may enjoy that, especially if you like binge debating, watching debates on, on a binge level, okay? Because I try to be very fair with him to give him every opportunity. Um, he didn't change his mind. That rarely happens in debate, though I, I hope I was respectful. You be the judge of that. But if you have baptism questions, if you don't have four hours, there's a one-hour download you can get from IPI and Illumination. It's called The Water That Divides. I did it live at one of the universities with Q&A time, and that contains kind of the gist of everything for all your baptism questions. So thank you. All right. Row six. You see it? Seat G. OK. Hi. Okay. Oh my God, so loud. Okay. <laughs> I'm Paul. Okay, my question is how united should various churches of different denominations or different doctrines be? And I can't specify the word. I'm sorry, it's a little too loud. Okay. For, it's actually a little too loud for me. Can you say that again? Sure, I will. Okay, I'm Paul. That I got. Hey, Paul. My question. <laughs> My question is, how united should various churches uh, of different denominations or different doctrines be? How, how united should they be? Oh, like what's realistic, you mean? United, you mean like agreeing the same, on the same things? Working together. Oh, like ecumenically, coming together. Yes. So it's a, it's a good question. It's also a practical question. So, for example, in Scotland, where we live, uh, the government is very involved and has strong opinions about helping the needy. And they do a lot of that work through the Church of Scotland. So my wife is, has made a lot of friends in the churches of Scotland uh, because that's the easiest way to, like the soup kitchen she works at uh, every Wednesday. So that's good. I, I think the, the greater the, the separation, the difference in your fundamental convictions, the harder it is to work when the theology is really important. In a soup kitchen, that, helping the poor is something all groups tend to agree on. By the way, it's kind of cool because, because of her initiative, I've got to know the minister who has, he's, it's funny, he's asked me, he lets me preach if I want in the Church, church of Scotland. So I, I've been able to do that several times this year at three different churches of Scotland. I never say no to an opportunity. Okay. Yeah, I mean, do people bring their Bible to church? Of course not. It's not that kind of a church. It's more traditional. But, you know, infiltrating, I've done this before, and it's really paid off. But working together, pretending our differences aren't significant is not totally honest. Example, when I was in seminary, the, got the door on my right, uh, Walter was an atheist, why do you want to become a preacher? He said, because I can help by changing political views. I can share my politics, but I don't believe in God. Uh, okay, now how am I going to work side by side with Walter? If it's helping the poor, maybe. If it's, uh, you know, we're going to be presenting the gospel and bringing the community, it's going to be pretty confusing. You know, he's saying there's no God, and I'm saying there is a God. So I think it depends on the, the, the gap does that, does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? Right. But you meet people from other groups all the time. I would say one thing. You'd be respectful. That thing I had in there, the questions after Ephesus, well, I'm not going to respect you because we agree 98% of the way, but, you know, 
you're, you, you come to church on the wrong day or something. Well, maybe they're wrong, probably. Maybe not. But does it really matter that much? Um, different churches will develop different convictions about different things. And some things you may say, but that's not, we don't do that. Is it a salvation issue? I point you back to the paradigm of the three circles. They're the core doctrines, totally non-negotiable. If you say Jesus is not divine, it's very hard to say you're a Christian. Second John 7 tells us who you are, though. Then there's the middle circle, important teachings, not salvation teachings, but still important. Then the outer circle, that's peripheral. And if you'll think that way, peripheral differences, there's a lot of grace. Important differences, we can still be brothers and sisters, but we need to have discussion as we're collaborating. Core teachings, we, we cannot let go, like the seven core teachings in Ephesians 4. I hope that's helpful to you and to others upon whom I've inflicted that long answer. One more, or are we there? I see the hand in, in row five. Test one. Two more questions before we end. Very good. Um, it's just right in my hands, and after that we close with how much it costs to go to your tour, okay? Um, no, I'll point them to the web, my website. All right. My newsletter today has everything on the next four tours. Amen. All right. What is a good way to read the Bible in one year? A good way to read it in one year is to read it every day, and you'll finish before the year's over. Uh, the thing is, you miss a day or two. It's like with anything. You start falling behind, and all of a sudden, oh, I'm 100 chapters behind. Uh-oh, I'm 400 chapters. Oh, give up. Another year of not reading the Bible. So having a strategy, if you read three plus chapters a day, you'll finish it in a year. Uh, I mean, one way is to do one New Testament chapter and three Old Testament. You know, you'll finish in the autumn. I have lots of suggestions on that, tons of suggestions on that at my website, on how to read the Bible, like 52 practical suggestions, 52 keys to reading the Bible. There are books if you want. I've got my document called Helpful, Helpful Books. It's a thousand doc, thousand titles arranged by category, some of the best books to help you learn the Bible. I don't know how many books you've read. Maybe it's not a thousand. Maybe it's not even a hundred. But for most of us in this society, reading is important. Like, just as for the ancient Jews, big emphasis on literacy, knowing the Word, and learning the Word. And that's going to take some work. I don't care how old you are. God knows what your best is. Don't compare yourself to someone else. Think about what's really right and give your heart to God. Last question. The last one is, um, what is the most important doctrine in Christianity? The most important doctrine? I mean, apart from coming to midweek. That's, <laughs> that's number one, obviously. The most important doctrine. Of course, that, that question assumes we can boil it down to one doctrine. Can we have Christianity if there's only one doctrine? That would be a bit difficult. I mean, you could say the cent I would say the central doctrine is, is, the res is the incarnation. God becomes human, and that's how we have salvation. When I was with a Buddhist monk the other day uh, who didn't know a lot about Christianity, he said, can you sum up your faith just like briefly? I thought, well, you guys have the four noble truths. Let me give you four. It's in my, I put this in my newsletter today. I hope you guys got it. It's free. Might as well. What did I put down? Number one, God, who's separate from creation, created the world and wants relationship with us. Number two, we've blown it. We've wandered. We've messed up. We need help. Three, through Jesus, God has come to the world and brings salvation. And four, through Christ, all things will be made new. That was very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Jacobi. You, you got to, you know, to say here six more, that doesn't help. I don't, like, I don't think I can put it into one doctrine. And by the way, the word, the word love, that's not a doctrine. And that means different things to different people. Some people, love means anything goes. Never upset anybody about anything. Nah. Love sometimes has to be tough. On the other hand, yeah, it's... it's we need more than that. We need sentences. So that was my response to, uh, to that fellow, and I hope that in your outreach, you too will be forced to compress what you know, all right, so that others can learn simply without being confused.
thank you so much. And I'm giving up the microphone now. Are you coming here? Or thank you, Douglas, there? for the time. Let's give him another round of applause. And you know what? Douglas is not going to hate home right after this. If you have another question, do come forward. You can ask him. And right now, we thank you once again, Doug. And uh, we're going to pass the time to uh, Jettison and Fiona. Amen. Uh, thank you, Douglas, for preaching to us today. Uh, church, in a, love, in a world where love is scarce, God really wants His churches to be the greatest source of His love. And if we do not have love in our lives, we do not reflect the thing that Jesus is probably most known for, His immense love. Today, God is challenging all of us to watch our doctrine and our lives, to live lives filled with love. Uh, bro, you have spurred us on with God's Word, spurred our church to love God, His Word, and one another. Thank you. Hello. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for this lesson. I do feel like there's actually a lot of things that I need to digest um, because there's just so many uh, learnings and goodies that... Um, like new perspectives that I can uh, learn from. Um, and thank you so much for that. Um, I'm one of the f uh, many people that read Revelations 2 as um, the first love as like God's love. And I feel like, thank you so much for giving me another perspective of like how I should look at this. And through your lesson, you know, um, I, um, of course, I need to, I need some time to think about it. But um, off the top of my head, um, I think like something that I can bring home today is really just reflecting on my love for people and um, really just focusing on that. Um, and the three questions that you actually put up um, earlier, I felt like it's a really good, um, uh, really good three questions for me to reflect on myself. Um, and I think like as you were sharing as well, like I actually can't help but to feel a little emotional because um, I think like I definitely don't want myself, the ch my church and my generation to slide off, you know, um, and drift off from um, the word of God and the love that God has given us and for each other. And, um, and at the end of the day, I definitely don't want us to us and me to be known as one that does not love each other. Yeah, so um, yeah, so thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, for me to really just focus on like, yeah, building my life on Christ. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so um, brothers and sisters and friends, if you wish to learn more about Douglas and his ministry, uh, do visit his website at www.douglasjacoby.com. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Dearest Father, Lord, you are perfect. You are good to all of us. You are mighty. You are loving. You are full of grace. And you are compassionate. Father, all of us, we stand here before you today, uh, hopeful. We are able to live lives free because of Jesus' sacrifice. Father, we are honoured and grateful that you chose us. Father, I pray, God, today that your spirit will move our hearts, move this church to love one another and to love you. We are thankful, God, that you have spoken to us today we love you, and we love each other. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Um, let us break out for a time of fellowship. <laughs>